Hello, everybody. I just started the recording, so I uh, want to make sure um, everything is running before I get started. So um, my name is Maria Cogiasto. I am with the RCPP national team, and I want to welcome to the another session of the 2024 RCPP Town Hall webinar series, uh, Creating Your Proposal. Today it's June 20th, and this session is being recorded. Uh, we do have over 100 participants, so um, you know you, uh, you'll see the numbers increasing, and um, and uh, we look forward on presenting you today. So uh, next slide. Before we get started, we have a couple of announcements throughout the presentation. We do have uh, a survey. Uh, we want to get your feedback so we can improve for future uh, webinar sessions um, or next year. Next slide. Um, so today, uh, the like I said before, the slides are uh, are going to be recorded, and then they're eventually going to get posted on the RCPP website. It does take some time because of 508 compliance. So I know we have received uh, many requests uh, for copies of the slide. It's just there has been a delay because we have so many. But if you are participating in the sessions or if you know anybody that have registered, um, as we finish the webinar, I am uh, publishing uh, the webinars. So only the people that are participating today or have registered would get an email notifying them that the uh, recordings are available. But uh, we know that they have not been posted yet on our website, only the first one, I believe. So um, thank you for your patience on that. And hopefully you're able to go back uh, if you have been participating to listen to the recordings. Um, the, ca the presenters will introduce themselves with the camera on, but we'll turn them off. I'll turn mine for a minute. I think you guys have seen me in the past. So. Um, so just want to say hi, and then I'll turn my camera off for reserving bandwidth. Um, we we have everybody muted, but the chat is active. So if you do have any question, we ask you, as we have done in the past webinars, to type your question on the chat. We will be collecting them and um, try to answer them as the presentation is going, and then we'll do Q&A at the end. Um, we still have one session left um, next week, so hopefully you're able to participate as well on, on that one. Uh, next slide. All right, I think with that, I'm going to turn it over to Bree, who's going to uh, go through the presentation today. Thank you. Thanks, Maria. Hi, everyone. So NRCS has engaged with Metaphase Consulting to support outreach and education. My name is Bree Hebron with Metaphase, uh, and the RCPP team is also here to provide support for the Creating Your Proposal series. So as we cover this topic today, don't forget uh, that your state RCPP coordinator is a great resource for you and that contact information is available on the RCPP How to Apply website. And also we've already dropped the link in the chat. So as we jump into this, Maria mentioned the survey code. You'll see that throughout the presentation. We'll also post that into the chat as well. So don't forget uh, that the deadline is right around the corner. As Maria mentioned, we've got one more uh, webinar in this series that's going to be next Thursday. And then the submission deadline is on Ju July 2nd at 4.59 p.m. Eastern Time. Today's webinar is focused on the executive summary session of the RCPP proposal. We're going to go over an overview and then we're going to discuss in a little bit greater detail the two components of the executive summary, the goals and objectives, as well as the outcomes. And then we'll review some example answers for each of the two components. So let's go ahead and jump in. So the RCPP portal section labeled executive summary includes two components. The first one is going to be a desc description of goals and objectives. And then the second one is a description of expected environmental, economic and social outcomes. 
as you're drafting your responses, you want to include the details that we've highlighted here on the slide. You really want to think of the executive summary as an opportunity to emphasize some of these key factors, which include how the proposed project will address NRCS resource concerns in a geographic area, also the CCA concerns if you're applying under a CCA, how partner contributions amplify the impact of NRCS funding, the lead partner's understanding of RCPP program requirements, and then finally, the expertise, qualifications, and capabilities that the lead partner will bring to the project. So we've already done a couple of sessions on the narrative questions, and you'll know that we go into greater detail on some of these areas uh, in the specific narrative questions that are being asked, uh, but the executive summary is really a good opportunity to start addressing these issues right away. So let's go into a little bit more detail about what addressing conservation benefits even means. So this is actually, there's a little bit more detail here in the frequently asked questions document that's available on the RCPP how to apply website. Um, it's a very common question. We're going to address a little bit here, but also feel free to, to check out that document when you have some time. So there are two related terms. Um, conservation benefits are the partner defined objectives of a project, which NRCS defines in terms of resource concerns. The expectation is that financial assistance efforts must address local resource concerns and typically do so through some combination of management practices, structural practices, and or easements. So the problems may or may not be completely resolved, but NRCS planning procedures and practice standards establish processes for determining acceptable treatments. Outcomes, which we're going to talk about a, a, a little bit more throughout the presentation, must be assessed in terms of natural resource concerns addressed, or in other words, the conservation benefits provided. So as a reminder, if you're not already discussing how you were addressing conservation benefits, as well as any other of the, the specific details about your project with your RCPP state coordinator, make sure that you're doing so now. So the first field in the executive summary is goals and objectives. So in this section, you want to write a brief summary of the project goals and objectives. And we've got some some questions to consider as you craft your responses on the slide. So when you're you know, considering what you're going to fill in, you want to be thinking, what is the problem my project will solve? How does that problem align to an NRCS priority resource concern or a critical conservation area? What NRCS practices will be implemented to address the problem? And then what agency priority topics will be addressed? So to boil it all down, don't miss the opportunity not just to highlight the, the benefits of your particular project, but also address how your project aligns to NRCS priorities and practices. So let's look at a couple of examples here. We've got an example of a responsive answer for goals and objectives and then a, a not so responsive answer. So the responsive answer, I'm just going to quickly read, the project objectives are to permanently protect and restore degraded wet meadows and manage grazing to improve groundwater recharge and wildlife habitat, hab, excuse me, habitat, which are CCA priorities, while sequestering carbon, which is a USDA climate smart priority, using targeted easement acquisitions and conservation practices. The project advances USDA equity, justice, and equal opportunity priorities through inclusion of tribal, beginning farmer veterans, and socially disadvantaged stakeholders in project development and outreach planning and execution. Ecosystems, restoration experts, wet meadow conservancy, along with NRCS certified ACEP eligible entity Big Rain Tr Trust, Happy River Conservation District certified conservation planners, and outreach specialists 
and ecosystem services modeling experts, Western Rivers University, bring 60 years of collective experience with NRCS implementation programs to ensure project success. So you notice that there's a, there's a lot of critical information here, clearly highlighting the alignment to CCA priorities, as well as other NRCS priorities. It also, again, takes the opportunity to highlight the partners capabilities in this area. So in the example of a, a not so responsive answer, the example that we have here states the diverse skills and expertise of this partnership will ensure RCPP funds will get on the ground to address uh, NFO priorities by protecting ranches from development, sequester carbon and improve wildlife habitat. So as you can see here, this is a really general statement that's not supported by the how and why examples. And there's very vague references to the NFO criteria and project goals which really do not take the opportunity to demonstrate project area knowledge or a credible approach to treatment. There wasn't the opportunity here to really address how much the partner understands uh, the NRCS pr uh, priorities and, and, uh, and programs. So the other field in the executive summary is the in the RCP portal is about outcomes. So there are three types of outcomes that we've got identified here on the screen. So we've got uh, environmental outcomes, which are required for RCPP, economic outcomes, which are optional for RCPP, and then social change outcomes, which are also optional. So while environmental outcomes are the only ones that are required for your project, don't forget that priority consideration will be given for those projects that also include economic and or social change indicators analyses. So what do we mean by the term outcomes? So as you can see illustrated in the diagram on, on the slide, outcomes are what results when inputs like funding and skills enable activities like conservation planning and outreach that produce outputs. Outcomes are the measurable environmental economic and social impacts of RCPP project activities. And then we have some examples of some of the outcomes uh, on the slide on the right. And these include things like pounds of nitrogen runoff avoided, cost savings to producers, number of neighboring producers adopting a practice, and so on, as you can see from the slide. So as you approach writing about outcomes for your executive summary and other narrative questions, here are some things to keep in mind. The response should clearly show how the project deliverables connect to the expected outcomes and how you're going to plan to measure and report those outcomes. You also want to have estimates of expected project outcomes um, if possible. So the methodology for outcome measurement will be further developed upon the award of the project. So while every detail of how the partnership intends to quantify outcomes does not need to be included, our CPP proposal evaluators will want to see that partners have given thought to how they will approach measuring and reporting outcomes. Estimates of expected project outcomes should be provided if possible. However, the methodology for outcome measurement will be further developed during the agreement negotiation process. It should be clear in the proposal how the project deliverables connect to expected outcomes. So the ability to develop, measure, and report on environmental outcomes of RCPP projects will vary by project type, natural resource concern, and available tools and methods. So NRCS may be able to assist with environmental outcomes modeling for some projects that address water quality improvements using standard conservation practices consistent with the agency's conservation effects assessment project. Outcomes for some projects may be directly measured, while other projects may rely solely on local scientific expertise. So there's a, a customizable outcomes template shown here on this slide. It might be helpful to consider um, as you look at how you measure, monitor, and model for environmental outcomes. So the example provided for wildlife is for wildlife resource concerns in this particular example, but the template is easily modified for water quality, water quantity, or soil health. For other resource concerns, which 
for which the template is probably not as easily customized, we really recommend that you work with your state RCPP coordinators to develop a template um, or a plan that's appropriate for your specific project. So here, if you take a look at the example that we have on the screen, um, this just highlights, you know, with the RCPP investment of A dollars matched by B partner contributions over C years, we have made lasting improvement to the biodiversity of D, which represents a geographic region over the initial benchmark E by improving F acres of habitat and increasing our priority species population by G to a naturally sustainable size that will benefit the region for H years. So the definitions of all of the letters here but you can see how clearly this is quantifying the outcomes in this particular example. So understanding the economic and financial impacts to producers of implementing conservation actions is critical to driving lasting adoption of conservation practices and systems. Conservation actions that negatively impact a producer's net profit are less likely to be implemented and sustained. Economic indicators can quantify the financial impacts of conservation practices on a farm, ranch, or forest land. Economic indicators that may be used to report outcomes include, but are not limited to, uh, conservation cost effective, uh, effectiveness. So this is the cost to the producer uh, of the practice implementation versus the conservation benefits. Also economic and financial benefits, the impact of conservation implementation on net profit, the value of the farmland or farm assets. And then also the valuation of ecosystem benefits, benefits to downstream beneficiaries, local economies, uh, just for a couple of examples. So partners measuring economic outcomes will need to collect financial information from producers and measure baseline economic indicators at the outset of the project and then evaluate change in those economic indicators over time. A case study approach is commonly uh, is a commonly used means of reporting on the economic and financial impacts of conservation implementation. So for economic and financial analysis, a partner should refer to the NRCS technical note on developing economic case studies. Uh, applicants are encouraged to consult their resources available on the NRCS website. Uh, partners are also free to explore other analytical approaches in consultation with your state RCPP coordinators. So reporting of social outcomes can inform strategies to increase adoption of conservation practices and systems in pursuit of lasting change beyond the duration of an RCPP project. Social outcomes analyses consider the factors that go into a producer's decision to undertake conservation activities, how that producer's decision influences other producers, and any broader impacts on communities. So we've got some of the factors included in this evalu evalu uh, uh, evaluation that may include, but are not limited to, things like characteristics of producers and forest land owners, perceptions of characteristics of conservation practices, timing of conservation adoption, conservation adoptive motivations, just to mention a few. And again, we've got several uh, listed on, this, on the slide here. Partners measuring social outcomes should measure baseline social indicators at the outset of the project and then evaluate change in those social indicators over time. In measuring social outcomes of an RCPP project, partners should maintain a focus on the factors motivating or influencing landowners and communities to adopt and maintain conservation approaches. So partners may wish to refer to the social indicators data management analysis, which is called SIDMA tool. This is one option for you to use. Uh, there's some, in, there's some uh, good examples on how to use this on the SIDMA website. Partners who conduct an analysis of social outcomes of their project should make sure that this effort is overseen by a qualified staff person or third party.
So let's look at uh, another set of examples uh, for outcomes. So the responsive answer that we have here, this project will expend X million of our CPP funds combined with Y million in partner contributions over a six year period to restore and manage 24 targeted wet meadows in the Happy River watershed. Benchmark conditions to be measured at treatment sites include the background soil carbon dioxide respiration, soil organic carbon content, soil water holding capacity, estimated sediment transport, and undesirable plant species composition. Data will be collected annually at each site following restoration. The expected 1,500 acres of restored wet meadows will sequester about X tons of carbon, increase groundwater recharge capacity by Y acre feet, improve Z acres of improved wild, uh, wildlife habitat. Data will be collected following NRCS, Regional Water Control Board, and International Climate Change Protocols and will be modeled by Western Rivers University. So this is a responsive answer. You notice again, it's got specific outcomes. It's got the, the specific quantitative information here. It also has highlighted, as we just mentioned, the, quali the qualified uh, Western Rivers University who's going to be doing the data modeling. As we look at a non-responsive answer, we the example here is the project project will spend X million in RCPP funds with a one-to-one -one partner cash and in-kind match to increase soil carbon storage by 20%, improve habitat, reduce erosion, and recharge groundwater on about 1,500 acres. We will look at the studies mentioned in scientific articles and design our data collection and modeling tools after we get funded. So this is a very general response uh, that does not demonstrate partner program understanding or a well thought out outcome. Essentially, this one has uh, said, hey, we're, we'll figure all we'll figure our outcomes out after we get funded, which doesn't demonstrate that there's a well thought out plan and a, uh, you know, a plan to not only uh, illustrate certain outcomes, but how those will, will be measured over time. So with that, we are uh, we've covered the information in the the webinar presentation today. We have the resources on the screen as well. Uh, there are also resources that we've posted in the chat. Uh, we're about to jump into our Q and A session. Um, as you have questions, or if you're thinking about questions, both on the subject matter that we covered today, as well as any other questions for the RCPB team, um, please go ahead and uh, enter those in the chat so that we can hear from our uh, RCPP subject matter experts. Okay, Thank and you, just three. Yeah. Oh, thanks, no. Maria. It's okay. Yeah, I was just getting myself unmuted and copy some questions. So uh, we do have the um, survey uh, up so you can take a picture with your phone and um, provide us with feedback. And right now we have two questions on the chat that are both related to the um, SITMA link. So I have posted the social indicators, data, data analysis, management and analysis systems um, website on the chat. And then, um, Seth, I'm going to turn it over to you, but I'll read the question. So the next question we have, um, it says, uh, regarding the 5% TA for NRCS, non-delegable tasks, should these be budgeted in TAI or TAE? Thank, thank you, Maria, and sorry for coughing in people's ear. If you could hear through my hand, I apologize. No, well, we didn't. <laughs> oh, good. Um, so the way that the portal is working currently, it does, in fact, as the question suggests, reserve TA for NRCS use, and that TA amount will be 5% if the entered amount for partner TAI and TAE doesn't consume the 25% available. So it's kind of a long-winded way of saying you as a partner don't currently enter a TA number for NRCS use. You just enter your TA asks, ideally after having consulted with your state coordinator and having learned from them how much TAI they think NRCS would need, so that as you enter your partner numbers, you leave enough for NRCS in that TA budget. Even if you don't and your proposal gets selected, 
there's a fair chance that that TA split between NRCS and the partner will need to be renegotiated during PPA negotiations. So as long as you get the TA in there that you feel you need for your project and you make sure that you've had requested the 7% TAI so that you're getting the full 25% TA in the project, there will be enough TA in the project to negotiate how the project gets implemented once you get to negotiations. Long-winded way of saying there's some funky rules in the portal with percentages and stuff. They don't work great right now. They're a little confusing. Get your asks in there. Make sure there's enough TA in the project, i.e. maximize the 25%, and expect to sort out the details during PPA negotiations. Thank you, Seth. I can read the next one. Resource concern for a state application. Can CCA resource concern be referenced, or should applicant refer to a set of a different priorities for an entire state? And if that later, um, where it is, where is the best place to find those concerns? So each state does work with their each NRCS state office does work with their state technical committee to identify state resource concerns of priority, which are not the same as CCA priority resource concerns. The CCA priority resource concerns do not apply to a state project at all, so I don't really see any reason why a proposal would reference them. Rather, a state or multi-state proposal would identify one or more eligible resource concerns in the drop-down lists, and if they wanted to tier those back to the priority resource concerns in the state as identified by the state technical committee, they would do that in the narrative questions. So hopefully that helps. Thanks. Uh, the next question reads, for climate mitigation and adaptation focused projects where the results are increased carbon sequestration and landscape re resilience, are other environmental outcomes also needed? You need an environmental outcome that is going to address a project resource concern. So depending on how your project is viewing the carbon sequestration equation relative to the NRCS resource concerns, you will need an outcome that ties back to an NRCS resource concern and your asserted benefit to carbon sequestration. It only has to be one per project as long as it's not a CCA project and it's a non-CCA resource concern. If it's a CCA project, the one you need to have at least one CCA resource concern, which might necessitate more than one environmental outcome. Okay, the next question is, is grant writing to secure non-USDA funding consider a contribution? Um, you're supposed to have all of your contributions lined up more or less at the time of proposal and supported by contribution letters. So typically we wouldn't expect a bunch of grant writing to be occurring after and only things that are occurring during the term of the project are eligible contributions. If, however, you had a particular contribution dropped out, drop out, and you needed to scramble to find a replacement, scrambling to find a replacement contribution is a potentially eligible project management expense and could be counted as a project management contribution, but only in that sort of specific situation. Okay, our next one is what is type two supplemental agreement? In RCPP Classic, we have two types of supplemental agreements. All of our supplemental agreements in Classic and in AFA are a mechanism where under NRCS can obligate funds directly to a partner versus to an eligible landowner or producer. So in Classic, a Type 2 supplemental agreement is the mechanism that we can use when specific eligibility requirements are in place to obligate financial assistance dollars to a partner to implement one of three very specific eligible FA activities. FA that NRCS determines as necessary to support an easement closing, i.e. like a type three, so kind of set that one aside. Um, FA that implements an approved watershed plan, that one obviously only applies if you're in a watershed project. And the final one is FA determined necessary by NRCS to support a program contract. So that one is the most common of the three in classic. It's not very common probably less than 5 to 10% of our money goes out through a type 2 supplemental. And basically it requires a situation in a given project where, yes, there's a producer contract between NRCS and a producer, but something about that producer contract is more readily implemented by a partner. For instance, say you needed to do some drainage canal work on a drainage canal easement that traversed multiple 
producers' lands, they all had drainage problems. So each one of them had a drainage management contract between NRCS and them. They're going to do some local work on their farms. The partner might come in and do the work on the drainage canal through a type two supplemental. Again, it would be exceptional to use a type two rather than normal. Thank you. Asking for a partner for a CCA proposal, is it allowable for some of the technique for some of the potential project sites to be outside of the CCA boundary if the proposed site is in a county that intersects with the CCA boundary? The wording in the NFO basically allows us to expand the definition of a CCA boundary to include not only the portion of a county that is within the CCA boundary, but the entirety of the county that is traversed by a CCA boundary. So in this case, it is possible that an entire uh, producer's operation could sit in that portion of a county which is traversed by the CCA boundary, but be entirely outside the CCA. As long as that producer's operation is in that county, they would be potentially eligible for treating the resource concerns in the CCA. Again, that contract has to treat CCA resource concerns. So if you're looking at terrestrial habitat for a specific target species in a CCA, and it doesn't exist outside the CCA because the boundary is correct, then even though the, the county line is in a funny place, you can't get to that other guy. On the other hand, if the resource concern exists outside the CCA in a county traversed, then you're OK. Thanks. Is the hiring of a if the hiring of consultants to provide hands on practice training, practice calibration, provide troubleshooting support services, maintenance, uh, best practice, best practices be considered TAI or TAE? Um, it's a little unclear to me that any of those expenses are eligible expenses. Um, I think that real issue here is who are they training and what sort of why? So if a consultant is going to be hired to actually do a plan or a design, those are TAI expenses. Um, and those would be eligible if you hired somebody to do them. But to train anybody else to do them is not an eligible expense. That's specifically precluded from RCPP, which is to say you need to be a qualified TSP to be a, get, able to get ready. Now, if you had to train a landowner to do a certain amount of O&M, you might potentially um, hire a contractor to do that as TAE, but you can't do any training of staff as TAE because that's not what it's for. That's a partner administrative expense and it's precluded from inclusion in the program. Thank you. Last questions I have right now. Can for-profit partners, engineering consultants, crop advisors, communications firms, providing pro bono services, provide partners contribution letters? Absolutely. We would love to see uh, everybody bringing good things to our projects. The real key here is if they are for-profit partners in their estimation of valuation method, they need to represent only their actual cost of providing the donated pro bono service, not their billable cost, because of course their billable cost does include um, unknown administrative and or uh, additional expenses that we can't allow because of the NFO language on only allowing NICRA rates up to that uh, 10% or the established NICRA rate. So essentially we have to dissect these, these for-profit partners billing rates and make sure that they're not including illegitimate costs in excess of those allowed indirect cost ratios. Thank you, Seth. I don't see any more questions right now, so we'll just give it a few minutes and see if we get additional questions. In the meantime, I'll just mention that I didn't uh, keep up with the questions list today, so I haven't provided written answers yet. Thanks. OK, we just got one more question uh, related to the last question. It's salary without benefits consider the actual donated cost that is certainly a decent basis for an estimate of the actual cost it's probably going to underrepresent um, because we could actually pay the salary and direct friend benefits of that employee providing the service but then you're going to need to track their time spent on it and that that's actually what it was and then you'd be there so it's it's you're definitely on the right track okay i got one more 
is assisting a landowner to enroll in an RCS program such as a forest management plan reimbursable as FA? So assisting a landowner in an application process is potentially um, TAI and it is not reimbursable as FA as such. It's potentially reimbursable as TAI or donatable as contribution, as it were, but it's definitely not FA. Okay, um, the next one is just a comment. Please share the input model page from the presentation. So I, I'm assuming they're talking about the sigma that was mentioned. So I'll share that link again on the chat. So it's recent to anybody. But I don't see any additional questions right now. Okay, I should stop saying that because then another question comes. <laughs> does the RCPP portal take, wait, it moves. Uh, does the RCPP portal take the 5% administrative cost from NRCS? Question mark. Is that in effect this year? So the way this ties back to my very first response, there's some weird stuff that's happening in the portal this year with respect to the math because um, effectively we don't have a 5% requirement anymore. What we're doing now is allowing the partner, requiring the partner really, to enter their two TA requests, TAI not to exceed 18% of the project total, and TAE not to exceed 7% of the project total. Unless the partner requests um, the TAE amount in 7%, they're never going to at that full 7% level, they're never going to be able to earn the full 25% in the project. But with respect to the 5% reserved for NRCS, that comes out of the available TAI. So to the extent that a partner does not enter 18% as their own TAI needs, up to 5% of the available TAI will be reserved for NRCS use. In the end, though, you're not always going to see 5% as the NRCS number because if the partner's numbers total more than, uh, uh, you know, more than 20%, there's no, there's not going to be 5% left for NRCS. Again, all the numbers you enter into your proposal with respect to TAI are only proposal numbers. Ultimately, we're going to evaluate the project proposal based on the expectation that a partner provides some TAE or some TAI if they're proposing either of those activities, but we're not evaluating the actual numbers that they're proposing. We're going to award a budget and then we're going to go into PPA negotiations knowing that we may have to rebalance the NRCS and partner asks because the math around those two asks is so hinky in the current version of the portal. But end of the day, if you need TAI in your project, request the full amount of TAI that you need up to 18%. If you think that's not going to be enough to deliver the FA, request the TAE up to 7% and get your TA total as high as you can, i.e. where you think it needs to be, and then plan to renegotiate balances um, during the PPA negotiations. Thank you, Seth. All right, I'm going to keep reading. We get more questions. So next one says, uh, briefly revisiting uh, environmental outcomes. Do these need to address both CCA resource concern if applying as within a CCA and an RCS priorities and specifically discuss as to how or if addressing a CCA resource concern, if that's sufficient, is that sufficient and it doesn't need to be specified as to how NRCS priorities are addressed? Like a multiple question. <laughs> question. I, I, I think I get where they're going with this one. And I'll just say this, their minimum outcomes in any given project is one environmental outcome. And if it's in a CCA project, that one environmental outcome would always have to be tied to a CCA resource concern. If you're in a CCA project, um, and you have other resource concerns that you're interested, either because they're a priority to the NRCS state or because they're a priority to the partner, then you would potentially end up with multiple environmental outcomes because you need one for the CCA resource concern and one for any other additional considerations that you might have. End of the day though, you really only need one and in a CCA project, it could just be the CCA 
ACCA resource concern. You also don't have to have environmental or social outcomes, and they're not recommended unless they are a critical part of your project. Because the real purpose of our CPP program is to get financial assistance dollars on the ground to benefit resource concerns faced by producers. We're not really in the business of a big outcome model. So big expanded outcome list with a lot of TAE, especially our CPP funded TAE, uh, actually detracts from the program purpose of delivering financial assistance to eligible producers. So you want to look at that balance in your proposal real carefully and make sure you're you're presenting a viable mix of FA and uh, TAE for outcome assessment. Thank you. I think I can answer the next one, Seth. Uh, Please. <laughs> somebody with, uh, was joined, would join the meeting late. Is there a link to a, the full presentation or here or online or send by email? So just for everybody aware, uh, once we're done with today's webinar, I will publish the webinar, but only people that are attending today or have registered but were not able to attend will get the link of the recording. So um, you should be able to get that as soon as I publish the, the link. OK, so the next question says, uh, does the 25% TA only apply to NRCS RCPP funding, i.e., is it possible that partners bring additional TAE and TAI so that the total TA for the project could exceed 25%? It is not atypical for partners to bring um, high percentages of TA as their contribution, and that often sends the total TA in a project over the NRCS cap, which the question correctly observes is 25%. So yes, it's certainly possible. It's also possible, and I think it's really worth mentioning, to go the other way. Even though the portal sort of forces you to request TA, um, especially if you want to maximize the project size at 25 million, the portal is going to request you to maximize the TA request at 25% by entering the TAE of 7 and the TAI of 18. But many projects don't require 25% TAI. And if you want that maximum size project, you're going to end up asking during the PPA negotiations, hey, can we convert some of our award from TA to FA? The agency often supports that TA, almost always supports that TA to FA conversion because we have that money and, and OMB supports it as well. We very rarely, if ever, support the reverse conversion, a waiver to increase TA above 25%. We don't like that. We don't do it. Um, so there's some additional considerations. Thank you, Seth. Okay, the next question, I think I'll be able to answer that also as well. Puerto Rico is not included on the contact list. Can you please share the contact information? So if the question is who is the RCPP POC in Puerto Rico, I just put that uh, name on the chat. So, um, so you should see his contact information. Okay, next question. Could you talk more about the NRCS ranking tools and strategies for selecting eligible applicants um, slash producers from enrollment, EI card, et cetera? I'll, I'll touch on this, but I'm gonna start with um, the suggestion that you really dive into this in depth with your RCPP coordinator, because they'll be able to give you an example that really fits your project well. But basically the way CART works is there's a, a number of buckets that NRCS manages points in. Some are related to particular practices. Some are related to the impacts of practices on resource concerns. Others are purely question based. CART allows us to set a mix, a percentage mix between these different categories and types of questions and ultimately award points based on what we think uh, will be the applications that have the greatest benefit to the targeted resource concerns in the project. So somebody who has mostly treated resource concerns in their project often will rank more poorly than someone who has a lot of issues on their place. Because if we're able to get on the uh, place with the guy with a lot of issues and give him some FA and help him get up to a more, even a more basic level than the other guy started at, you're going to get more bang for the buck. And that's sort of what the ranking tools are supposed to do. They're not perfect and they often require some tweaking. That's why I really suggest you work closely with your state coordinator um, to figure out how you want that ranking tool to work for your project. They're very tailorable. Um, can the partner and lead yeah, contributors that's a second question. Mm -hmm. run a solicitation to help select the most eligible 
producers for. So we do have the opportunity in our CPP Classic for a lead partner to uh, propose a bundle of applications that can work in a number of ways. The lead partner could certainly try to take the applications directly and submit them on behalf of the producers to NRCS. That's not typically how it works because that requires a power of attorney from the producer to the partner. What typically works better is for NRCS and the partners to work together. Once the applications have been received, the lead partner may be able to um, identify priorities amongst those based on their considerations. If they can't be built into cart right away and those partner considerations be captured in the bundling points that are also a feature of cart. So again, these ranking discussions, you're best suited to jump into the details with your state coordinator. There's a lot of ways to get through ranking, and that's only on the classic side. On the AFA side, the lead partner and is actually doing the ranking and making the selections. So if if the desire really is to have the lead partner in the driver's seat, recognizing they have to follow federal anti-discrimination law, et cetera, then an AFA project is better. Um, more commonly, if the lead partner is you know just concerned about a particular resource concern and making sure it receives the appropriate consideration or maybe the inclusion in a particular planning document. There's lots of ways that CART can recognize uh, partner concerns without necessitating partner ranking. So talk that over with your state. Thanks. I'll read the next one. Who is responsible for submitting the state conservation as questionnaire? Does the partner submit that with the application or does the state office handle that? Who signs the questionnaire, the partner or the state coordinator? So the lead oh. partner or applicant is responsible for reaching out to the lead state and setting up a conversation about that state conservationist questionnaire. Um, how that conversation occurs varies locally, and um, sometimes it is actually with the state conservationist. Sometimes it's going to be with the state coordinator. It really depends on how the particular NRCS state is set up. Ultimately, the product of that conversation isn't the questionnaire. The questionnaire is really just a tool that's designed to guide the conversation, help the partner and the state focus in on issues that the partner is going to want to resolve and capture in their proposal. So ultimately, the, the questionnaire doesn't have to be submitted or signed or anything. It's really just a tool available to force this conversation and try to get to better projects and better proposals. Thanks. The next question is, should we include a budget narrative in our additional documents to upload? So in the TA section of the proposal, if you know your TA cost structure, um, that is a perfect place to document those costs. Um, the rest of the budget, at least in a classic project, is really producer contracts and so is captured in the FAA deliverables and therefore doesn't need to be addressed. If you're talking about an AFA project and you're looking at uh, partner as contractor model and you know some of the costs associated with the partner delivery of FA, by all means, include those in your proposal. If they don't fit anywhere easy, you can put them in that uh, TA upload section. It's a good place that provides an unstructured upload. Um, but don't include a bunch of superfluous information. If, you know, present stuff that uh, paints the picture that you know what FA is going to cost and here's what it is. Don't tell us why your product is the best product out there. Uh, the next item is about an issue with the accessing the RCPP portal and I was just looking to see because usually oh, we I chose just, here I'll help this. So I'm I have just a copy perfect, paste uh, it. Mm -hmm. I actually have a, a suggestion beyond that Maria okay. before you paste that particular sure. one um, because I just learned from our contractors this week that the most common cause of that single sign-on error mm -hmm. um, is, I'm sorry, I'm trying to find my, won't give me my signature blocks, um, is a f attempt to use the wrong login site for the portal. So if you get that single sign-on error and you're not using this login address that I just pasted into the chat, start there. That should, if you are, have, if you've successfully created your login.gov and the contractors have successfully associated that with a portal login, and you just are getting the single sign-in error. Um, if you use this link the first time you log in to log via login.gov, it's going to ask you a bunch more identity questions, and it will basically upgrade your eAuth from a level one to a level two, and you'll have simpler access going forward into the portal. 
Um, that's only the most common cause of this single sign-on error. If using that single sign-on link doesn't, and then going through the login.gov process doesn't resolve your issue, then as Maria suggested next, um, your I'll paste it now. <laughs> oh, I've got it here. Um, oh, you got it too. Yeah. Mm -hmm, yeah. Your next recourse after trying that different login link is probably the email address in this um, suggestion here, because what you want to do that that email address goes to all of the IT support for FPAC, which is us and uh, RD and FSA. So what you're going to want to do is use that email address and very specifically try to get to the right contractors by using this as your subject line. Um, partner portal, RCPP portal access issue. That will get it over to the a particular group of contracts that supports our application versus one of the 20 or 30 other applications supported via that same email address. And we'll probably get you the most timely response. But definitely start with that login link that, that may resolve your issue. Thank you, Seth. OK, we have seven minutes left. I just want to see if there are any additional questions. We'll give it another minute. Um, but want to thank everybody for continuing participating on our town hall webinars. Okay, there's a lot of, there's a few thank you. So thank you for participating. <laughs> um, so is there a specific a CV format uh, slash length for uploads, technical staff, et cetera? We did not oh, no. pr prescribe a format for those uploads. We really just ask that you be as direct as possible. A 20 page CV listing every article that somebody's published doesn't really add value, right? Like what we really care about is do they have experience providing project management? Uh, if that's what they're going to be doing in our project. What are the costs for them to provide that? Have you thought it through? Do you actually have eligible tasks in mind? Great. Use that uh, technical assistance upload to tailor, not broaden your proposal. Otherwise, you're just adding fluff and, and not convincing anybody. OK, there was uh, two more that came through. Along with the presentations, will the questions and talk points be shared? So if you're listening, you know, you're going to get the recording of these. So you're going to hear us uh, talk again and answer all the questions again. Uh, we are working on the um, on our frequently asked questions. So as we are doing these presentations, that gets uh, updated, but is not posted yet. But you would get a copy of this presentation. And then the next question is, are CVs required or are BIOS sufficient? And I would say along the lines of my prior response, there is no specific requirement for how you document the technical capacities of your staff. I would say if, if you can do a brief bio type write up that, you know, like documents somebody's experience relative to the tasks that they're going to be supporting. Great. Um, that's certainly going to be sufficient. But what's really more important is that you express an understanding of what those tasks are rather than just telling us about all the TAE you want. Like what what project management, what does that mean to you? What's it going to involve? That's really what that opportunity for upload means with respect to the TAE side of the equation. With respect to the TAI side of the equation, it's a little different there. You're trying to convince us that you actually understand practice standards or easement requirements or whatever it is. Um, so do that. Really focus your uploads on what you're asking for out of the proposal and try to use that upload opportunity to present a more compelling proposal versus just more information. Thank you. The next question is, will update a frequently asked question we posted before the July 2nd deadline? We're trying. I don't want to say for sure we will be able to do it. We, um, you know, just because it takes so much time to get everything in compliance. But these webinars have been shared with everybody that have participated or have registered. So if you miss anyone that you register for, you should have received a link with the actual um, recording. And we have been able, I think in most of our 
probably all but one maybe, we have been able to answer all the questions or at least go through all the questions and verbally respond to them. Hey, Maria, I'm going to duck out for my next call, but I just wanted to say thank you both to the attendees and all to the um, the contractors and the other presenters. I think this was a really good series. I hope that you all as audience members found it useful and um, please do follow Bree's survey. I, it helps us understand what was useful and what wasn't. Um, Thank Thanks you, again. Seth, and we appreciate all your subject matter expert feedback and um, you know, thank you for being with us for all of these series. Okay, since we don't have any more questions, I'm just going to end out the call. Thank you everybody again for participating. And, you know, remember we have our last call next week and we look forward to talking to you again. Thank you. I'm going to stop the recording now.